Hello Space Fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. In this episode, we're going to talk about two things today. First off, I'm going to talk about some feedback that I got from people in the industry on that episode I did on James Webb Space Telescope a couple of ones back. Turns out people in the industry are watching SFN, so I have some things to add to that story. Also today I want to talk about the fact that we finally have some telescopes operating on the far side of the moon. This episode of Space Fan News is brought to you by Mova Globes. Now you've seen one of these sitting here next to me for several SFNs now. They are powered by ambient light, so they rotate with no wires or connections of any kind. Now my favorite is this Constellation one, but they have lots of different ones, including a moon globe as well as globes of every planet in the solar system. So they are, they have all kinds of different ones out there. They make great gifts and you can see everything they have by clicking on the link in the description box below. So check them out and thank you Mova Globes for sponsoring this episode. Okay, I want to talk with you a little about a story I did a few episodes back on JWST. Now, I realize I've been doing SFN for a while now. I mean, I think I started around 2010 or something like that with SFN1. But anyway, this has always been a labor of love where I just share with you some stories that I find particularly interesting. And honestly, based on the view count, not that many people have really been watching this show over the years. So... I never really imagined what would happen after that JWST story that I did came out and the criticism that I leveled at Northrop Grumman, who is the main contractor for JWST. It turns out, to my great surprise, <laughs> that some people in the business do watch SFN because I got some feedback that I want to share with you. Now, while I stand by what I said about Northrop Grumman, mistakes were made during the construction of this mission. But I may not have been entirely fair to Northrop Grumman. Not all of the blame can be laid at their feet. Now, one major point that I didn't appreciate, but after thinking about it is obvious, and I probably should have, is that while the budget for JWST has ballooned to $9 billion, NASA takes 48% of that right off the top. And this is something I've experienced many times in my professional career, and it's common in science and academia. Most of the time, when a scientist gets a grant of any size for their research, whether it be from NSF, NASA, whatever it is, that money is given to the university or the institution where the scientist works, and they disperse the funds to the scientist to pay a salary and any salary of any postdocs, programmers, research assistants, or anyone else working on the research. The scientist also has to buy any equipment and computers that they might need through the university system. They can't just go out and write a check. The university does that. Now, all of this is to say that the researcher who got the grant doesn't control the money. The university or the institute does. And to do that work, to disperse the money and oversee it, they charge a percentage, which is called overhead. Now, this is money that the university takes out of the grant to pay for its cost in administering the grant. And this amount varies depending on where you work. But 40% or so is not uncommon. Now think about that. For every grant that goes to a scientist, almost half is spent on administration. Well, the same thing is going on here with JWST. Sure, Northrop Grumman got the grant to build JWST, but NASA is administering it, and they are taking 48% off the top. This money goes to hundreds of civil servants working at NASA on the project. And I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I know a lot of these people, and they are doing great work. But it's not fair to Northrop Grumman to say that they are spending $9 billion on JWST. They only control 52% of that $9 billion. So, that's one thing. And another thing is that NASA has created some of the problems themselves. Now, I've mentioned before that NASA has to approve any new technology that gets invented for this telescope. And that process can take some serious time. And that's made even longer when NASA has to shut down because the government has, which has happened at least twice so far. So NASA has added to the delay of JWST by taking time to approve various aspects of the project. 
That is not in Northrop Grumman's control. And one final thing that I should probably clarify that isn't fair to Northrop. Some of the technology that, is, that was adopted on JWST was forced onto the spacecraft by NASA against the wishes of, of Northrop Grumman. I'm talking serious fights have broken out at meetings where NG was forced to use parts that they felt weren't appropriate for the mission. I wasn't told specifically which parts they were forced to use, but I can be pretty sure that the word screws were used a couple of times in these meetings. So, as with everything, there are two sides to a story, and I was heavily working on NG as the bad guy, when really there is plenty of blame to go around for the delays and cost overruns on JWST. NASA isn't an angel either, and we should remember that. Now, here's something else you may find interesting. Built into the contract to build JWST are various incentives and bonuses that are paid when things arrive on time and on budget. And NG has accumulated hundreds of millions of dollars in these bonuses. And this is above and beyond the cost of the mission. So it can be counted more or less as profit, kind of an incentive for doing things quickly and on time and on budget. Now I've learned that if JWST launches and doesn't work, Northrop Grumman will give back all that money retroactively. It was part of the contract that was signed after the last delay and review that was announced in 2018. But wait, there's more. <laughs> wait, there's more. During his testimony um, to the House Science Committee, Greg Robinson, program, which is the program director of NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, said that Northrop Grumman has agreed that they will give back even more than what was agreed to in that clause, in that contract that I just said about the about the uh, bonuses that they got. So, yay, Northrop Grumman. <laughs> so look, I hold no illusions that NG is still going to make some money here. But at least that's a sign that they are willing to put a dog in this fight. I know that's a terrible metaphor, but you, you know what I mean, right? They, are, they have a bit of a vested interest in the succeeding. And there's one more bit of news I want you to watch out for. On November 20th, just past couple of weeks ago, NASA held a review to make the final decision on JWST's deployment. Now, this is a big deal. At that review, they, would, they got information that allows them to decide if JWST is 100% ready to go. This will be the final go, no-go decision for the project. If yes, the scope gets launched. If no, well, I don't know what happens. <laughs> now, I've been looking for the press release, but I haven't seen it yet. But I'm sure it'll come out in the next uh, few weeks or so. But that is the next big news on the JWST project. So let's watch out for that. Okay, so let me now segue into another story that I found interesting that I was originally going to write this SFN on, but I wanted to do that too. So we're doing both. Uh, it isn't a, But this isn't exactly a full episode on its own anyway. Now, you've heard me say for years that we are in the golden age of astronomy. Never before have we learned so much about our cosmos in such a short amount of time. Thanks to advances in optics, detectors, data processing, and so much more, we, what we know about the skies over our heads is growing at an amazing rate. It's a great time to be an astronomer. But now... I'm starting to think that we're also entering a golden age of space exploration. Not since the 1960s have we had so much going on with improvements in rocket technology, space vehicles, and, sci space vehicles <laughs> and scientific in instruments that are designed to work in space. Now, NASA has been at this for decades now, and so has Russia. But both countries started exploring space all the way back in the 1950s. But now we're seeing more countries enter into the space exploration realm as well. I've already done some episodes about ISRO's efforts in India to land a rover on the moon with Chandrayaan-2. The European Space Agency has been sending probes to comets and Mars, and we're all looking forward to ExoMars 2020, which is Europe's effort to land on Mars and look for life. And China has been very active too. Early this year, I told you guys about the Chang'e 4 lander on the far side of the moon, which along with the Che Chiao Orbiter, comprised a really amazing mission that has seen humanity's first visit to the lunar far side since the 1960s. I think it's really amazing that so many countries are starting to explore space. With 
commercial companies making space cheaper, this may be the very early stages of a space rush, which I'm really actually quite excited about. And now there's another country that has entered the fray with the Netherlands China Low Frequency Explorer or NCLE. Now this marks, at least as far as I can tell, the entry of the Dutch space effort. And for all you people who've been telling me we got to get telescopes to the far side of the moon, this will interest you. NCLE is a low-frequency radio telescope that was included as part of China's Chang'e 4 mission, and it's aboard the Chechiao Communication Orbiter, which was primarily designed to relay messages from the lunar lander to the, uh, on the surface back to Earth. Now, Chechiao was launched on Mar May 21, 2018, and reached its home at the Earth-Moon L2 point a few days later. The primary mission of the orbiter was to relay communications from the lander to Earth, and that mission has now been completed, so it can start a new life by becoming a radio telescope. This Dutch instrument was sitting there waiting for the main mission with the rover to complete. Now, before it was launched, the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy and the China National Space Agency, CNSA, collaborated to build the telescope and make it a part of the orbiter. The NCLE is the first observatory built by the Netherlands and China with the goal of observing signals from the far side of the moon. Now, this location has a lot of promise because it rests in a spot protected from all the radio noise from the Earth and allows the receivers some rather remarkable sensitivity. From this location, NCLE will allow astronomers to listen at the 21 centimeter wavelength, which is which should sound familiar <laughs> because it's the wavelength where the hydrogen atom changes state, and it's very useful for studying the early universe, particularly the time when the first stars and galaxies formed in the cosmos. Up till now, the Dutch team has been sitting quietly while their Chinese counterparts operate the orbiter and it finishes its primary mission with the lander. But now that it's done, they are coming to life. They began their mission by extending the three five-meter-long antennas, which started to have difficulties as it kept extending. I guess they were sitting just a little bit too long. <laughs> so, in an abundance of caution, the Dutch team decided to stop short the extension of the antennas and start taking data. If things go well, they'll try to fully extend them at a later time. What they're thinking is that by sitting in the retracted position for so long, which is a bit longer than expected, the mechanisms, the mechanisms on board may have become degraded, so they're just going to take it easy, one step at a time, on these antenna. Now this platform is a test bed. The NCLE was designed to work with a variety of instruments as well as on different wavelengths, so I don't think we've heard the last from the Dutch in this arena. The spacecraft they built is a good example of international cooperation and will finally allow humanity to get a foothold in a really prime part of solar system real estate, which is the Earth-Moon L2 point. The Earth-Moon L2 point is a spot that follows the moon in its orbit around the Earth, which is 28 days long. This puts it forever behind the moon with respect to Earth, protected from all the radio noise that we have here. The NCLE will be able to observe during the lunar night, which is 14 days long. The length of one day and one night on the moon is 28 days. It matches its orbit around the Earth. Its daily rotation matches its orbit around the Earth, which is why we only see one side of the moon. Now, during the lunar day, the sun's going to be in the way, so it won't be taking any data then. So, well done, guys. Both the Dutch team and CNSA, first to rove the far side of the moon, and now the first to observe the heavens from there. This episode was sponsored by Mova Globes, who make all kinds of really cool, cool spheres, just like this, <laughs> that make really cool Christmas gifts for any space fans in your family. This is the Constellation one, but they have lots more to choose from, so please check them out in the description below. These things are really great. I endorse these. They are high quality, and they last a long time. So please check them out. Description, link, etc. below. <laughs> Sorry, I can't stop playing with it. <laughs> All right, well, that is it for this episode, Space Fans. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.